Hello. My name is Erna Gross, and I am the CEO of Asante Africa Foundation. We believe that through skills and education, we can prepare young people to tackle whatever life challenges come their way, to thrive economically, and to be the catalyst for positive change. So this afternoon, I am deeply honored to get to moderate this panel uh, regarding a Pan-Africa national and local approach to green skilling for climate change and climate action. So with that, let me invite my three austere gentlemen to join me on the stage. First, His Excellency, Professor Mohammed Bel Hussein. He is the Commissioner for Education, Science and Technology, and Innovation for the Africa Union Commission. Please join me on stage. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Our second speaker for the day, Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Environmental, Water, and Climate for the Republic of Zimbabwe, Professor Prosper Matondi. Please join us up here. And Jesper Vallette. He is the Director of Partnerships for Humana People to People, a CSO who works across many, many countries doing the actual implementation. So before I invite the first speaker up, you will be involved in, a, in the conversation with us. We will share with you an Africa, Pan-Africa context, and then you will hear a little bit about how the Republic of Zimbabwe is using a national approach. And then finally, how do we make this real? I am an engineer by training, and I have been trained to look at complex system problems using system solutions. Today, we've all been talking about education, technology, gender, climate. One of my very wise mentors said, enriched minds will collectively solve all other problems. And enriched minds come from skill and education and lots of hands-on practice. So toward the end, be thinking of your burning questions because you will have a chance to engage with us. Since the day is nearly over, we've got to make sure you're actively engaged as well. So let's, let us begin. I will invite the commissioner to join us at the podium to share with us the approach from the Africa Union. trying to get rid of this mask, but it seems that it has been spilled into the wire. <laughs> yeah. I put the mask because I have a, an allergy to air conditioning, so when I am not speaking, I put the mask. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, being here. Thank you, Erna, for uh, calling uh, uh, us to, to this meeting and inviting us. Thank you, colleagues on the on the podium. Uh, it's interesting to see that um, we have uh, one uh, representative of a member state of the African Union. We have uh, one representative of the African Union Commission, uh, which is my good self. And we have also some very important stakeholders like NGOs, international NGOs, in the uh, person of uh, Prosper and uh, our moderator, Erna. It is interesting to see this linkage because life today is about really connecting and trying to work together towards shared objectives and uh, shared uh, uh, goals. Um, uh, why it is important? It is because, in fact, we don't play exactly the same roles. We at the African Union Commission we have the legitimacy given to us by the member states. 
So when we speak, we have a convening power. We are listened to because we have been entrusted by the, the member states. But the African Union Commission is not a country. So don't expect the African Union Commission to be an implementer, a direct implementer of any kind of project. That uh, responsibility lies mainly with the member states. So Mr. Permanent Secretary will give us some examples on that. And also, um, it is important to, to, to have uh, uh, other members of the international community or the national communities, civil society, uh, private sector, uh, academia, etc., etc. So uh, I'm in charge of education in the African continent and uh, I will try to start by giving you a little bit of indications related to that sector uh, and also to inform you that because of those indications, uh, we are going to have uh, something special on 2024. Um, the education sector is not in good shape, not only in Africa. In fact, in the whole world, there, is, there are big setbacks especially in the education of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Mm. Just two days ago, I was reading in the news that uh, France is going to adopt Singapore's methods to mm. teach mathematics because they realize that their children are not good in mathematics. This is a developed country. This is a European mm. country. Uh, the pandemic of COVID has compounded the situation which was already quite bad before in terms of education to the extent that the UN Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, uh, amongst all the crises that were in hand in 2022, uh, food crisis, Ukraine-Russia crisis, financial crisis. Uh, he chose or he picked up education as a theme where he convened a summit in New York in September 2022. Uh, because the, the uh, sustainable development goal number four on education is badly off track globally. Mm -hmm. But that, that, that global uh, situation is uh, mainly due to Sub-Saharan Africa. What is the situation in Sub-Saharan Africa? I'm not going to lecture you too much, but I want to give you two or three figures so that you, 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 you measure the magnitude of the problem that we, are, we have in hand. One, if we look at the children, uh, the children in, in uh, the age group of 5 to 19 in sub-Saharan Africa is 500 million, half a billion. Among those 500 million, 100 million almost, 98, 97, 98 mil, uh, mi 100 million are not attending school. They are not going, they are out of school children. So when we talk about demographic dividend, uh, this can become a demographic threat, not a demographic dividend, because when these children are out of school, they become vulnerable to any kind of problems, like, you know, they can, they can become, uh, you know, victims of uh, drug, drug trafficking, of, of terrorists, uh, of, of any kind of, of, uh, of uh, vulnerability and crime in the society, and they can threaten the social, uh, the social stability of their communities and the, uh, the, the other communities because it also feeds uh, illegal migrations and things like that. One, children not at school. Second, we have a deficit of 15 to 17 million uh, uh, 
teachers because the teaching profession has been more and more not given the, 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 the importance it deserves. So we, we are in a situation where we are in a dire need of qualified teachers. And uh, the uh, third element is education, poverty education, mm. or education poverty. It means that what is it, what is it, what is the definition of uh, education poverty? It is the capacity of a child at 10, at age of 10 to read uh, a simple text and understand it or to do simple mathematics. In Africa, the estimate made by the World Bank, UNE UNESCO and UNICEF says that nine children out of 10 are not capable of reading a simple text or doing simple mathematics. That's the depth of our problem in the continent. And uh, given that situation, during the summit that was uh, convened by the UN Secretary General in September in New York, we convened a parallel side event with the heads of states, with uh, civil society, with our partners, with the uh, uh, UN agencies to talk about this and to push for uh, a more, more attention given to education in our continent. And uh, with that, we started a, a, a process and the momentum went going. And uh, last year, during the African Union summit, the heads of state decided that year 2024 will be devoted to education. Meaning that in 2024, the focus of the African Union will be mm, on education, meaning that all departments will work towards you know, uh, having having common uh, objectives related to uh, education. The uh, idea is to to build resilient uh, education systems and to transform what we we have today to try to at least, if not reaching the the sustainable development goals by 2030 because it will they will not be reached but at least bridge the gap mm. that uh, that is uh, uh, that we we realize so to build resilient education systems uh, the african union is dedicating the theme for uh, for ed to education in 2024 and we will try to focus on development and implementation of effective, long-lasting, system-wide transformational strategies for education and skills development. Uh, the intersection of education and sustainability becomes non-negotiable. It is no longer a choice. It is an imperative. We need really to bring these two together. Why is it important to bring skills development to the forefront of the climate agenda in Africa? As the world and Africa in particular grapples with the escalating climate crisis, the, the need for a skilled workforce to address this challenge has become increasingly evident. And skills development plays a crucial role in enabling individuals, communities, and businesses to mitigate and adapt to the impact of climate change. And let me remind all of you that uh, the African continent ha has the, the least uh, carbon emission in the world, but it is suffering the worst uh, impact of climate change. Transitioning to a low carbon economy requires a workforce with the skills to develop and implement renewable energy sources, improve energy efficiency, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We in Africa have this Agenda 2063, which is like the, the, the uh, development blueprint of Africa. And this Agenda 2063 talks about catalyzing skills revolution, underpinned by science, technology, and innovation. Skills development in new technologies for clean energy, energy efficiency, and emerging green industries will enable African countries transition 
to new jobs in the green economy. Yes, it's good to, to say these nice words, but uh, what are the challenges? <laughs> well, we have a lot of challenges. One of the most important that I have just mentioned is the, this bulk of, of youth and unemployment. And yet, there is also a surge in demand for new and emerging skills, often referred to as green skills. These skills encompass a wide range of disciplines, including renewable energy engineering, sustainable agriculture, climate change adap adaptation, waste management, etc. As industries adapt their operations to reduce their environmental footprint, they require workers with the expertise to implement sustainable practices and technologies. What is the African Union doing to harness the potential of skills for the green transition? But before I go to that, I would like to recall again that if we do not really take care of the, the primary levels of education with more focus on STEM education, for instance, with more focus on uh, review of curricula, with requalifying our teaching uh, workforce, there is, there is no way we can have highly skilled people when we go to the secondary and tertiary level. So it is a continuum, and we have to start from the, from the, the foundation, and foundational learning is very, very uh, important if we want to reach those levels that I am talking about. We have a couple of, uh, couple of strategies that we are working on. We have a continental TVET strategy uh, and a decade plan of action, which goes with that strategy, and uh, in, in this strategy, you know, uh, there, is, there is a focus on uh, the promotion of digital green and blue skills, meaning that uh, we are trying really to push countries to go towards uh, those, uh, those uh, important uh, changes in terms of content of uh, curricula, etc. We have also uh, a, the African Union Climate Change and Resilient Development Strategy and Action Plan, which goes from 2022 to 2032, where increasing climate change literacy across all levels of formal and informal education and skills development curricula is one of the action areas. So that is a second uh, thrust on which we are working. We have also the, uh, 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 an initiative which is called the Bridging Innovation and Learning in Tibet, built, built uh, project in partnership with UNESCO and UNEVOC. One of the focus areas in this, in the peer learning platform uh, is greening of TVET and equipping learners for the emerging green jobs by provi providing them with green competencies that can enable them to adapt to changing work processes and profiles. Of course, this is what we do, but member states also have a lot of initiatives here and there uh, on their own, which complement what we are doing. We have another uh, important uh, uh, project, which is, is, not, is a flagship, flagship program, actually, of the African Union, which is called the Pan-African University. The Pan-African University has been established by the member states tw 12 years ago, and it has, uh, it has the peculiarity of uh, enrolling students for all African countries. We have four institutes which are operating, one in each of the sub-regions, and in one of the institutes, there is a program uh, of uh, uh, a program related to climate change sciences, with two tracks: one track on engineering on, on climate change, and one track on policy uh, studies on, uh, again on, on climate change. It is important to mention this because uh, in each cohort of this institute, which is called the Powers Institute, Pan-African University, Water, Energy, uh, and Climate Change Sciences. Uh, it trains the students at the level of masters and PhDs, and the cohorts are uh, uh, comprised of students coming uh, generally from 40 to 45 African countries, mm -hmm. meaning that it is the word Pan-African is really represented in practice in, uh, in this uh, institute. 
There is need to support African countries develop their national skills, strategies, curricular and training programs that align with climate goals. It is not an, an easy task because countries that are at different levels of, uh, of development of curricula, of education reform, etc. So our role of advocacy and our role of uh, putting in place standards and norms that country could be inspired by to adjust and adapt their own policies is very important. And again, we can't do it alone. We have to do it with member states and we have to do it also with uh, our partners. Additionally, we need to work with particularly the private sector to promote apprenticeship programs in green industries to build a talent pipeline of youth with green skills. The African Union is committed to providing the platforms at the highest level for advocacy on catalyzing skills uh, or catalyzing skills potential for a green economy in Africa. And by dedicating the year 2024 to educate and skill Africa for the 21st century, we hope to, we hope to spotlight the critical importance of education and skills development for inclusive and sustainable economies by advancing the agenda for greening TVET and promoting education for sustainable uh, development. Uh, again, I will finish just by saying that talking is good, but talking is not enough, that action is the currency of change. Let us commit to tangible steps, uh, investing in infrastructure, investing in teacher training, investing in technological integration. I didn't say much about digitalization, which is an important tool in our hands to try to bridge the gaps in terms, for instance, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, deficit of teachers. It can, it can solve partially the, the problem and scholarships that bridge the gap between ambition and accomplishment. I would conclude by saying that the African Union Year of Education 2024 is our canvas, a canvas where we paint a picture of prosperous, sustainable and equitable Africa. It is within our grasp to sculpt a legacy where education is the cornerstone, skills the mortar, and the green economy the edifice upon which future, generation, uh, future generations will thrive. I thank you. I hope I did less than 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. This is a come on. <laughs> Loud. <laughs> whoop, whoop. Thank OK, you. thank you. So permanent secretary, thank you. please come give us a few examples of what the Republic of Zimbabwe is doing and yeah. how, as a part of the African Union, you're bringing it to life. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. You can hear me all? You can hear me? Eh? Yes. Yeah. A very good afternoon or evening to, to you all. It's a pleasure to, to be here uh, to have this conversation around education within the context of for climate and also environment. And, uh, and the green economy. Uh, my name is Professor Matondi. I'm the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of uh, Environment, Climate, and Wildlife. It's a, it's a relatively new ministry. But uh, the work that we do uh, touches a lot on, uh, on, on education because climate on its own is a very complex, complex subject. Complex in the sense uh, that uh, it is why we are here to, to negotiate, perhaps at the very largest global congregation uh, around a particular geopolitical matter that affects each one of us. Uh, COP28 is indeed uh, a place and a platform for us to learn, to know, and also to educate each other, but also to make all of us aware of the importance of how climate impacts impacts, soci impacts society. But when you then look at uh, how climate is wired and the environment is probably rewired into the climate agenda, there are so many issues uh, of contestation globally, but also nationally that touches on the very soul of uh, what we learn, how we learn, and from whom we learn. And that's critical to at this juncture to, to be able to be able to, to decipher and also to know. 
for Zimbabwe, COP28 represents the very epitome of for how we want to engage globally. Mm -hmm. We are a very small nation, a nation that uh, probably has gone through so many fundamental transformations. But you can point out quite clearly that uh, one of the most outstanding achievements of our little nation is around education. Mm -hmm. From the 1980s beyond, and we, our political leadership invested very heavily and, uh, in, in education. And we will probably now stand as uh, one of mm -hmm. the top, top uh, country in terms of our educational, educational achievement, achievement. But that has been 40 years since it's our independence in 1980. But much of uh, our achievements uh, are then reflected in what, in how we continue to engage and also try to improve ourse ourselves in terms of understanding many facets that include that includes climate. But a, a history that we are very proud of is also around uh, co the conference of parties in terms of climate. We, we were the, the second country to host the conference of parties mm -hmm. in 1996, 1997. Uh, we did so under very difficult circumstances. It was almost 10 years after the Rio Earth Summit in, uh, in Brazil. And immediately, we tried to rest on our interest and our investment in, uh, in, in, in the environment sector for those 10 years. We, we, we elected to host the second, the second conference, conference of parties. So we have got a, that history that continues then to tell within the context of each conference of party. And it's now, 20, it's now 28 years. But uh, over those 28 years, the country has gone through fundamental transformation and the education system is one of, is one of them. Uh, I, re I refer to it because from the year 2000, probably four years after hosting the Conference of Parties, the country has been undergoing transformation based on its land reform program. That saw it uh, slept with, uh, with illegal sanctions. And for over a dec two decades now, the country has been under economic sanctions, mostly from, from the West by the United States, and partial sanctions from the EU, and inability to access resources uh, from multilateral institutions such as uh, facilitated by the World Bank and the IMF. And it has been also been very difficult for, access, for us to access resources even for climate financing itself. So that is then tells the implications on what it means for the economy and for education. Mm -hmm. Irrespective of all those sanctions, for the last five years, our economy has been on a growth tra trajectory following the change of, the change of, of leadership. Uh, five, five years ago. Uh, from inheriting an economy that was based on a GDP of about 27 billion, the country is now on 67 billion after five years of, uh, you know, of, 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 of transformation. That growth that averages about 5% per year has been quite phenomenal. But that economic transformation is not then translated quite enough into our objective and our desire to have a better education, a better education sector. Of course, the plus two years, or I can say plus two years before, we added a, a variant to our edu educational system. We introduced STEM very strongly uh, into, the, into the economy, and that really has led to fundamental transformation. Today, uh, we do have education 5.0 and education 8.0, where we have deliberately made a, a concerted effort to ensure that across all our tertiary institutions, we have got innovation, innovation hubs. And those have really transformed our educational, our educational system in very, very funda fundamental, fundamental ways. We have got about 22 universities now. From by two decades ago, we had three or four, but now we have got 21 universities. We've got about 50 tertiary uh, tertiary institutions and underpinning that is about 9000 school, 9000 schools that uh, we are transforming on our own based on on our own resources of course the education around ensuring that the climate message gets into society is something that we need to do more work 
more work around, invest more on that. And it's something that we are trying to do as part of our Vision 2030, which also aligns with the broader Africa objective towards, uh, towards the agenda, to ag agenda 2063. But agenda 2063 cannot be achieved by business as, as usual. We understand we, and we know very clearly that uh, climate is a very difficult subject for most people, ordinary people. How do we ensure that uh, we go back to settings to ensure that uh, from a very foundation of our young children, we are then able to mainstream climate and the environment in whatever they do? That's very fundamental. And the reason why we're struggling geopolitically now and even here at the Conference of Parties each year is because of our limited understanding of what climate means. And even the belief that some of our colleagues don't have around what this climate change is, 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 is all about. And that requires all of us to put our minds, our minds together and with our children to walk them into the current context, but also to have a definite definition of what the future holds for them. Because everything we do today, even everything we discuss at this conference, has got an implication on children and the youth. How do we bring them on board to ensure that uh, we mainstream climate into what, into, what, into, into, into what we do. When I was listening this morning around the agenda, the president was setting the agenda for the next five days. He says to us that uh, we are short of meeting the global uh, target of 1.5 degrees by 2030. And uh, unfortunately, all of us, we must bend the curve. There is no plan B, there's no alternative, there's no, there's no other solution other than just engaging. We have to force each other, irrespective of the differences we might have uh, historically and now and geopolitically, we still have to agree at this conference of parties of what needs to be done. The message we want to take back through, uh, through ensuring that our children also be a part of the agenda is that uh, the, today when you look at our global stock tech, you look at the global goal on adaptation, you look at our national determined contributions, all of the data from the IPCC reports are showing that uh, we, we will be well above 1.5 degrees by 2030. And unfortunately, we might not see some communities, some countries, island states and so forth, those who are, you know, uh, contiguous to, to oceans and seas might not be able to survive once again. That's the crisis that, that we face. And that crisis is something that for us in Zimbabwe we take, we take very seriously. We have invested a lot into, into, into the climate and environment agenda. And we are probably at this moment the first African countries to acquire the very latest radars for early warning systems that uh, we've, we have deployed for us to understand the implications of climate on our, on, on, on our people. Our radar systems is able to provide enough uh, and adequate data to even our regional neighbors. And we've done that without external, external support, based on our, own, on our own resources. Today, we have amassed uh, enough capacity towards the deployment of all automatic weather stations. Uh, we have done our, on our aviation services, but all these tools and instruments of uh, understanding early warning and the climate issue is all aimed at ensuring that we are able to, you know, to assuage the, imp the, the impact of climate change on our people. But we are very happy to be, to be here to share these experiences because they are, they are important for us and also to, to our children and the future of, uh, of planet Earth itself. So thank you very much for the invitation to come to have a conversation with yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Now we're going to bring it to the rural context, and Jesper Volet is going to share with us how Humana People to People is actually achieving the upskilling across the countries. Thank you very much, Anna, to uh, this introduction. Uh, Mr. Commissioner and Permanent Secretary and Erna, um, I'm here representing the Federation Humana People to People. 
Uh, we are an international network of 29 organizations working around the world, and among them, 10 Af countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Our international headquarter is based in Zimbabwe, and therefore it's a very great pleasure to be with especially the Permanent Secretary of Zimbabwe and the African Commissioner for Education here. Humana grew out of a movement of progressive educators uh, in the 1970s, and it was rooted in the struggle against apartheid. Um, ever since then, we have spearheaded uh, holistic development programs that harness the power of education and collaboration. We always put communities front and center in what we are doing. And where the preceding speakers have spoken very much about macro issues that are essential to address. Maybe ours is more from uh, the community part and from what actually happens in the field. We believe education is not only a human right, but also the cornerstone of sustainable development. Our approach therefore aims to provide students and learners of all ages, the majority of whom they come from rural areas, with the foundational knowledge that the Commission also mentioned before, they need, while nurturing the capacity, to become proactive agents of change. This applies to all our educational programs, which early include early childhood development, primary school, teacher training, primary and secondary education, functional literacy, and TBET. And that's the topic that brings us here today. Humana runs 16 TVET colleges uh, across eight countries in South Sub-Saharan Africa, including Zimbabwe, and we have approximately 40,000 graduates from the schools over those years. With our schools, we work to complement the government efforts by providing ed educational opportunities and economic empowerment to youth from rural and remote areas those who are generally hardest to reach. Within this targeted group, our members have also made concerted efforts to work with and empower women and persons with disabilities, among the other often particularly vulnerable groups. This conversation about youth skills and greening of Africa's economy comes at a very critical time. Looking at dem demographics, we have heard about earlier also, we know that among youth, more than 70% of the population in sub-Saharan Africa is under the age of 30. This places enormous pressure on labor markets that are unable to absorb this growing workforce. Examining the birth rates globally, the countries within the 10 highest rates of birth in, in the world are African countries. They are between 4.8 and 6.7% uh, 6.7 children per woman in 2023. Versus, for example, China and other countries we normally consider as very highly population growth, they are only at 1.7 children per woman. That means that we know that Africa's population will double from now by 2050. Approximately 24 my, five more years. We need to consider the, education, uh, the situation of education. There have been notable improvements in enhancing, enhancing the access, but there are significant challenges and disparities. These challenges include a stubbornly high rate of out-of-school out children, children, limited access to quality schooling, persistent gender disparities, and a shortage of qualified teachers inadequate infrastructure and poverty-related obstacles. We have heard about it before, and but they are to be repeated because it is the scenario in which we have to work. All of these considerations, and that's even before we talk about climate change and those additional challenges that brings us. One billion children are at extremely high risk of the impacts of climate crisis now. Every year, about 40 million kids can't go to school because of disasters like floods or storms. These events also bring diseases. The extreme weather linked to climate change causes schools to close, kids to miss school, 
It impacts their caregivers and it hampers their physical and emotional well-being and their capacity to learn. While the education systems are severely impacted by environmental and climate crisis, they also have a critical role to play in securing a sustainable future for all. And it's by addressing this that we think that education can help transition communities to become greener and more climate resilient. Communities who are hit around Africa by the situation of climate change are not sitting waiting. They are all very, very much engaged in doing something about it and they are doing everything they can to deal with it and adapt their already hard uh, livelihood to these new situations. But we can see that with more resources in knowledge and also economic resources, they can do much more and that's what we need to work on getting to happen. Our work with smallholder farmers has helped shape local adaptation planning in Angola and Namibia. We have increased private sector engagement and resilient value and change in Zambia. And we have restored coastal ecosystems in Mozambique and facilitated disaster risk reduction in Malawi and Zimbabwe, just to know a few of the highlights all the time with the communities as a principal actor. We also tackle education for a green economy from various entry points, working in collaboration with other key stakeholders, greening the curriculum, training of teachers and trainers and school managers, adaptation of TVET offered to respond to green transition, to include resilient agriculture, sustainable, uh, uh, food production, sustainable fisheries, renewable energy, water management, construction, and many more. Many of the skills we think of as the green TVET skills are not new skills. They are the skills we are already doing and that are sustaining the existing economies. But they need to be adapted to be become wiser and cleverer to, to adjust to clear climate change. We have a few examples that we would like to say uh, that we have very concretely going now. It's with the Adaptation Fund. Our members from Namibia and Angola are working with 160 drought-struck communities to increase their climate resilience and adaptation capacities. As part of this large-scale education, there will be a number of actions specifically targeting the educational system. Climate context-relevant teaching and learning materials will be developed in collaboration with the ministries. Teaching and learning materials are distributed among local primary schools. Climate change action centers, primary school teacher training, colleges, and nearly 2,000 teachers will be trained within that project. Additionally, schools in the area will establish 50 environmental youth clubs where trained teachers and community volunteers will allow <coughs> children and young people to learn about simple and suitable solutions to address climate change. Another project we do now, and that is with funds that fantastically enough have arrived from the Green Climate Fund and to Community Action in Guinea-Bissau. Our member organization is executing a Green Climate Fund uh, project, as I mentioned, that also plays strong emphasis on skills development. More than 450 youth will be <coughs> trained in TVET courses on climate resilient agriculture their rice fields are terribly affected by uh, increasing salinity of the waters that comes in uh, because of the sea rise level, and they need to change to new practices in order to maintain livelihood. I'll conclude with three key takeaway messages. We need to prioritize skills development and education. That's crucial. More funding is necessary. Education is underserved among climate funders and bilateral donors. We need to join forces, strengthen collaboration at the local, regional, and global level. There's a lot to be learned from what we have heard here and from a lot of things that are already being done, but much more could and has to take place uh, if we are going to see this becoming something we can believe it in the future. Thank you very much. Absolutely. So our time is running very quickly, 
And what I would love to do is I'll take one burning question from the audience, and then I'm going to ask each of our guests to leave, with, uh, leave us with one closing key thought. But if you fell asleep, they want to make sure you remember when you walk out of here. Any questions? Okay, his hand went up first. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 the key point that you have pointed today was the overpopulation. You're trying to solve uh, uh, green uh, life, you're trying to solve the sustainability, you're trying to solve all that, but the overpopulation is the prevailing issue, as you have mentioned. So, so what are you going to do about it? Was that for Jesper? Yes, sir. Yes. I'll be happy to Please. respond to that. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. Would you Permanent start? Secretary. <laughs> permanent Secretary. Yeah, Permanent Secretary, yes. So, uh, yeah, the question around the, the demographics uh, and what it its implication. Uh, it's a very it's a very difficult question because for for us uh, we are very small population we're actually saying that uh, there's less of us in our own country yeah. no no yes yeah when you then look at the the whole of africa from that perspective but you just have to be specific also uh, per, per square kilometer in our country we still have got enough resources to sustain the population that the population that we have the question around population does demographics does not does not apply uh, w in fact we are saying we need we need we need we need more, we need more people you know in our in our own, <laughs> in, our own, in our own context you can't compare us to uae to dubai per square, per square kilometer but the point is we are able to feed our own people i would have to I told, told you about uh, the concepts that we've developed around conservation of agri agriculture, where we are able to feed, we meet food security at also led level at village level by a very simple concept of agro, agro, agro farming, agroecology, where with a diameter of 52 holes by 19 holes, we are able to feed a family for 52, for 52 weeks mm -hmm. uh, using those, co those concepts. Because we said we are not even using a large scale commercial farming for, for, for that. So the population factor for us does not arise. Yeah. Let's take it offline. Yes. After, I know, but I'm getting the signal of. Yeah. <laughs> so in closing, let me, let me hand it to the commissioner first. What, what would be a key thought you'd like this audience to remember? Okay, I will try to, to answer the gentleman while giving the <laughs> message. The, the best way to have a good demographic uh, planning uh, or, or control is development. Mm. The best pill for women is educate them and they will know how to manage their families because they are the ones who can manage the community. Thank you. Wow, yeah. that's pretty awesome. <laughs> Permanent Secretary. Yeah, for me, for me, I think we are, I would say that we are at the edge of the precipice <coughs> uh, for existen existentialism. If we don't act on climate change, we are gone. Wow. Yes, sir. I would say that I, I think that is very important with the the dramatism of what we are looking at and what we are being told and what we are known. I think it's very important to know that the communities are acting a lot and they are doing a lot. Of and uh, it, it's a very strong thing also to know to that we are working with all these people and we could together channel more resources to the front fighters in this, which would have a very big uh, guarantee of the future for all of us. That's my message. Great. 
And I'm going to leave you with a bit of optimism. I am regularly surrounded by the young people of East Africa in the most off the paved roads communities you can imagine. The ability to innovate with local resources and indigenous solutions is incredible. And if we all take the time to come together as a community with the different stakeholders, we're going to find our way. No one ever said it would be easy, but we will navigate out of this if we bring everyone to the table to help be a part of the solution. That's every one of you sitting here, your own children, the organizations you stand with, and all the communities in the countries that you represent. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm, gonna I'm going to ask you to stand up, and I'm going to teach you an African clap. Please stand. <laughs> so those of us in the conferences, put, put your big titles away for a moment. You know, we're all like, oh, yeah. So we're going to do a round of applause, and I'm going to ask you to make some noise when you do it. Yeah. So it goes like this. <laughs> Thank you. We got to have some fun in this place. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you. Thank you.